and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we're releasing a special episode. This is my response to a recent documentary that just dropped on Netflix. It's trending in the top 10 of all content on Netflix called Live to 100 Secrets of the Blue Zones. Um, As you know, around here, we really love talking about the blue zones, what they are and what they are not. And so I wanted to take some of the clips that we have used and recorded over the years and put them all into one big episode here together for you. If you've listened to Balanced Body Radio um, long enough, you'll know that I'm not great at brevity, so this will be a long episode. I just, we we keep hearing this message that to live a long and healthy life, you must be eating a plant-based diet. Stan Buettner is the one who who made the show. Um, He's he's been responsible for the Blue Zones for quite a while now. He's written several books, and he says that one of the connecting pieces of all the Blue Zones is they eat a 90 to 98% plant diet. And so um, that's just not (laughs) the same information that I'm getting from other people. So I really wanted to include this so that you can be educated and make your own decisions about how you want to be eating and what things really contribute to human longevity. There is going to be a ton of crossover in all of these clips. Like I said, I tried to edit them down a little bit, but it's gonna be long, it's gonna be a long episode. So hopefully it is really informative for you. We're gonna talk about the Seventh Day Adventist Church. We're gonna talk about um, you know why certain blue zones were chosen, why Loma Linda, was included later on as one of the the blue zones. It was actually named the fifth blue zone along with the others. So this should be very informative. I'm actually going to start this out by using a clip that I recorded with Katie Wrigley being on her show, the Pain Changer podcast. This was actually something that we recorded. And then immediately after this clip, the basically we lost power and lost the entire episode. So we had to refilm the whole thing, but I did keep, keep the audio up to a certain point. And so I'm going to release that. It's going to be a me kind of explaining this thing and giving a bit of an overview about, you know, how cereal companies got started, why the seventh day Adventist church owns the blue zones as a concept and what the truth actually is in some of these places. And before we go into more of the results from the diets, you had told me something fascinating about cereal one time when we talked. And I would love for you to share that in this episode. And like, where did this idea for having this cold cereal, what we have grown up with, you know, the food pyramid and the have your milk and your cereal and put milk in the cereal and have your juice and have all this extra sugar and shit on your stuff in the morning. Like, where did that come from? Part of this complete breakfast. Yes, <laughs> part of this complete breakfast, and it's it's, oh it's enriched like crazy. But like, I can't. I haven't eaten cereal in years because it's so enriched with iron. Like, you can go to YouTube videos, and so people will like if you put cereal in a bag with milk and you let it sit, the iron will actually pull out of it. You can see the iron shards in the cereal. It is insane. And that's the same thing would be in anything you see enriched flour. You have iron shards that you were eating with anything that is enriched. Yeah. People don't realize when you walk down the bread aisle, what you're smelling is the yeast. It it takes massive amounts of yeast to make our flour rise now because there's so many of those minerals and enrichments, quote unquote enrichments we added back in. It's, it's absolutely ridiculous. Okay. So let's, Let's tell the story. We're going to go back to the doctor who we mentioned earlier, Dr. Gary Fetke. Dr. Very, Gary Fetke is an orthopedic surgeon. He works on shoulders and hips and knees. As the years are going on, um, he's starting to notice that Friday at the clinic at the hospital, he's doing more and more diabetic amputations. If, if you've ever seen one, you know. If you haven't seen one, imagine the nastiest, foul-smelling, d- totally discolored, like your limb is dead, literally like no blood flow. People are, have stories all the time about stepping on glass and not realizing it until seven days later because they had no feeling and now it's horribly infected. Mm-hmm. So every Friday, he started doing more and more of these amputations to the point that his Friday staff started calling them. I'm going to get this wrong, but I'm going to try. Fetkies, fucked up, fungating, fructose-free, food folly Fridays. I can't even repeat all, that. <laughs> I know. It, it, it's very long, but funny name. But he was all he was doing was amputating feet. And so he started to go to his patients to see what they were doing. They saw the hospital food. And as part of the hospital food, they were getting like like three servings a day of ice cream. It's like that, that, that's standard. Like we have to give you this ice cream. And so he was like, whoa, hold on. You can't do this to my patients. This is the last thing they need. We're, sugar is now a poison to these people. We can't give them any. They can't have any more. 
And they, they, he was responded to by saying like, look, it's the guidelines. It's what we have to give. This is where we get our funding and we have to do it. So he starts getting a little bit more outspoken about it. And that incurred the wrath of several um, organizations down in Australia. And one dude in particular was hired to um, basically put this guy on trial. So he fought for six and a half years not to get his license removed. Wow. Yeah. Crazy. So his wife, who is not, who she had a nursing background, but wasn't in the industry, you, you poked mama bear. So Belinda, his wife, was like, absolutely not. We're going to start to research this and we're going to get behind this. So she found that it wasn't the, the sugar companies that were behind the people that were going after him. It was actually cereal companies. Okay, interesting. What are the cereal companies? Well, one of the big ones down in Australia is called Sanitarium. Sanitarium is a company that makes plant-based foods and cereal, and they're owned by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Okay, why does a church own a cereal company that they don't pay taxes on? Interesting. Little Interesting. Weird. Let's go back to the Seventh-day Adventist Church and how they started. A group of Millerites um, were believing that Jesus was going to come back in like the mid-1940s. I want to say like 1944. And it was a lot of people. It was like 100,000 people in the United States. They sold their homes and quit their jobs and stopped going to school. And like they were they were set. Jesus was going to come back. Apparently Jesus forgot. So <laughs> Ellen White, a very young girl who, as a young girl, had a concussion, started getting visions from God saying that God had actually moved spots. He's still around, but he's still working things out and he's doing different things, but he's in a different spot. And he started, she started like recording visions. And as one of the people that started to work for him, John Harvey Kellogg, as a 12 year old, because his parents thought Jesus was going to come back, they didn't even put him in school. So then he had to get a job at age 12. His job wow. was a typesetter for Ellen White and Ellen White's visions. And some of the very first visions that she was having was about how horrible carnal sin was. Masturbating to Seventh-day Adventists at the time especially was like the absolute worst, worst, worst defilement of your own body that you could possibly do. John Harvey Kellogg had a ridiculous amount of kids, but they were all like adopted. So you've got this 12-year-old getting these ideas about masturbation. And, and it's, it's, it's basically like... These, the foods that these kids are eating, steak and eggs and normal food back then, is causing natural desires, and kids are acting on them. So the Garden of Eden diet was born to introduce bland foods to people's diets to try to squash some of those carnal desires and prevent masturbation. Later, they did send John Harvey Kellogg to medical school, so he was a doctor. He would treat people in what are called sanitariums. So look, it's, it's basically like... That those buildings are now what are hospitals. That concept came from him. He was the first doctor to ever wear a white lab coat. They would perform adult circumcisions without pain medications, adult circumcisions to help prevent masturbation. Uh, something they promoted for a long time. And not just men, oh. by the way, not just men. Yeah. And so anyway, as part of the Garden of Eden diet, they needed to create a food stuff that was very bland that they could give to kids as an alternative to what they were eating that was driving their hormones up. And hence, cornflakes were born. The cereal industry started in Battle Creek, Michigan. A lot of, you know, Graham from Graham Crackers was in that same area. Post was started by somebody else, was also an Adventist in that same area of Battle Creek. Cereals start to get made and distributed. The first dietitian's books that were ever made were in 1910 and 1917, I want to say, by Adventists. And those books had been used to, until very, very recently, promoting a plant-based diet because Adventists believe that when enough people convert to Seventh-day Adventism, that Jesus will finally come back. So that's the great thing about the Seventh-day Adventists. They don't try to hide the fact that they want people on a plant-based diet. They promote it. It's the reason why they now own the Blue Zones. You heard of the Blue Zones? From you, yes, but I hadn't heard of yeah. them before. So please explain what those are magical areas of the world where people are isolated and they seem to live longer than everybody else. Two scientists decided to study them and identified four of them in the world and talked about all kinds of different things, like things that they ate. They talked about how they have great communities. People are born and live and die in the same area. They're very social. They appreciate older people. Lots of really cool things that help these people age and age really well. Well, in 2004, I want to say Gam Butner was, was recruited as part of the project. And he's a reporter for National Geographic. And to sell this concept to people, they needed to have another blue zone. So they added the fifth blue zone, which is Loma Linda, California, which is not an isolated place. It is not a place where people live particularly long. It's a group of Seventh-day Adventists who 
who retire to this community. They eat really highly processed plant-based foods. They do have a nice long life. And some people say it's because of their diet, but it's a completely different area. But now that's promoted, the Blue Zones concept is now owned by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. He's sold many best-selling books. They promote a near plant, or I'm sorry, a near animal based, I'm sorry, a near animal free diet. Nearly 100% plant based. The Blue Zones diet recommends five two ounce servings of meat every single month. That's a total of tw- uh, 10 ounces of meat for the entire month. Um, they recommend a dozen eggs over the course of the entire month. And, and they promote this. And now your city can, can, for many millions of dollars, become a Blue Zones Project City and be identified as a Blue Zone Project City by following this plant-based message. These are the people that are driving this message home. They have all this information. Belinda, going back to the story, she researches, re- uncovers all of this and, and realizes where are all of these pressures coming from, from this company that makes cereal that is owned by a church. It is, it is run and promoted by a religion. People don't realize where where is all of this messaging coming from? Why is Tufts University coming out with a food compass that says branded cereals like Frosted Flakes are green foods that you should eat and red foods are ground beef and eggs cooked in butter? It, it's, it's madness. It's absolute insanity. And people don't know. And they're trying to do the best that they can. They're trying to follow the advice. And it's bullshit advice. And people don't know it. And they need to know because they're going to suffer. Yeah. They're going to be obese and demented, and have type 2 diabetes. We know that 7% of Americans are metabolically healthy, according to a 2018 study. That is pre-pandemic. 7%? 7%. 93% based on a few markers that they measured identified as metabolically unhealthy in this country. Wow. That's the state of where we're at. Like, if we created these guidelines in the 1980s and said that cholesterol was causing heart attacks in the 1960s, why is heart attack still the number one killer in America? And now we still have a cancer problem. And all of a sudden we have an explosion of obesity and type 2 diabetes and all these other chronic diseases. Where is this autism coming from? Where is ADHD coming from? Where, why are people getting dementia in their 50s? That's not, that's not like grandpa's forgetting things. He's got some brain fog. Like that's some serious shit. Like we're yeah. on the wrong path. And that's why we're, we're being lied to. <laughs> yeah, and some some of that can be explained by the screen time and what it does to to overstimulate the brain. Yes, but a lot more of it can be explained by diet. You said a lot that was really interesting in there. So, like the old diets, what I heard in there, the ones that were recommended, those were more profitable. Yes, and cereal was profitable. And what's really interesting about the Seventh Day Adventist being behind this whole plant based movement, you know, the owner of Chick fil A is actually yeah. a Seventh Day Adventist. Ah, funny. Wow. Isn't it? Isn't it? Wow. Next, we are going to hear from one of the smartest people that I know. James Connolly is a writer. He's a producer. He's a documentary filmmaker. He is a researcher. He knows a lot about this kind of thing. And so we're going to listen in on a recent episode that we did with him. This was taken from episode 511 of Boundless Body Radio. And I just want to reiterate this this notion of a plant-based diet. We are already plant-based. We already, as a country, as a world, eat most of our calories from plants. So to say that we're not already eating a plant-based diet, is actually not true. So let's hear from James here. Well, we do live in a day and age where you can go to the grocery store just down the street and you can buy plant-based meat, which just that name alone is so absurd to me. And as we walk back some of these other stories and, and that one in particular, plant-based veganism, vegetarianism, and its roots in religion. I recently heard you on a podcast talking about this. We've talked about it before. I would love to go in depth in it. And <clears throat> You were just starting to kind of like talk a little bit about religion and one religion in particular, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And then you said something about cereal and, and you know, sexual pleasures. And the, I love this. The host was like, wait a second, what, what's this now about cereal? And I was so jealous of her. If I could go back and unlearn that story just to relearn it from you. Like, wait, what, what is this about cereal? Like, oh, sit down, buckle up. You're going to have a great ride on this one. Can we go back and talk about yeah. the, the, the relationship between religion and the plant-based kind of movement. Yeah, and it's and it's not specific to um, you know the uh, 
yeah. So I could I could go through the story that I always tell, um, which is like kind of it ends up kind of blowing people's minds because I think we grow up with all of this stuff from like Nabisco's, you know, uh, to graham crackers to you know uh, to the birth of cereal um, to all of those things, and I can do it pretty quickly nowadays. Um, the absurdity of it is that it actually like very very closely mimics what we're dealing with nowadays. So you get this uh, evangelical church um, that wants to create a kind of a new garden of Eden on the planet. Um, and I've listened to lectures before um, coming from Loma Linda University, which is a seven-day Adventist uh, university in California, uh, where they genetically want to modify uh, all carnivores on the planet uh, so that they can tolerate grasses and forages and legumes and stuff like that. So their idea is in order to create um, the second coming, this new utopia, the Garden of Eden on this planet, you, in essence, have to follow a very biblical tradition of like a few very choice passages from uh, the book of Genesis um, that talks about what the Garden of Eden was, uh, where the lion lays down with the lamb and where the, you know, uh, you only eat from the germ of the seed of the tree, uh, which is nuts and all of that other stuff. Um, and so their idea is to sort of modify um, using, you know, genetics in order to get ev almost everybody to adopt this plant-based diet. Um, Seventh-day Adventists are really, really interesting um, in the fact that, like, there's about 23 million worldwide. Uh, there was an uptick during COVID, so I think they were at 22 million before. But, they, man, they are just invisible. It's absolutely stunning how invisible they are. Um, New York right now is has a, a $2 billion housing project that they're building in um, uh, in East New York. Um, and it's run by the Blue Zones, which was bought for $72 million by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the Blue Zones, uh, Blue Zones is uh, pseudoscientific, uh, <laughs> National Geographic, weird um, Dan Buettner's like whole, uh, you know, idea of like the longest lived, uh, populations on the planet. Um, he goes into it. He said, most of them are primarily plant-based. I don't know what plant-based means. Um, the U S is plant-based with 70% of our food is plant-based. Um, actually 75% of it is plant-based. Everybody on this planet is plant-based. Uh, but he utilizes this to say that these are centenarians. Uh, this is what they eat. Um, and he ignores all, he will talk about it, but the blue zones as they're incorporating it into cities and around the world now, uh, primarily just talks about diet, right? No siestas in the middle of the afternoon, right? no like time out in the sun, no like long vacation times, like time with community or anything like that. We're just going to take the plant-based diet. We're going to, this is what America does, right? We take the one thing. We say the Mediterranean diet. We say, oh, eat fish and olive oil. You just ignore all of the other aspects of like Mediterranean culture that is cohesive and family oriented and, you know, uh, established connections across multiple generations where people take care of each other. Ignore all of that stuff. We're going to say, have some olive oil, eat some nuts and berries, and you're going to live for all of that time. So, Seven Day Adventism uh, was an offset of uh, the Millerites. Um, the Millerites were an apocalyptic uh, religious group um, built in this like one section in upstate New York called the Burned Over District. Uh, they called it that was because they had all of these apocalyptic cults and strange religions and um, uh, you know, um, like open sex societies and everything like that, uh, that happened with the sort of, uh, building of, uh, the, uh, the Hudson river, um, aqueducts that, that shipped all of these, uh, agricultural products to New York city. Uh, and so people started moving out of the city. Um, uh, and for whatever reason, uh, this, this whole area just became this like kind of commune of people trying out new religions um that's where you get mormonism from uh, until he was kicked out and shoved away and ended up in salt lake city um and you have uh so the millerites believed and i think it was like 1838 uh they believed that uh christ was coming uh, 
they did the calculations, they sold all their positions, they walked up on a hill uh, and waited for the second coming of Christ, and they called it the great disappointment because he didn't show. <laughs> <laughs> were they the ones right? were they the ones uh, renting billboards by the freeway that said the Mayan calendar is ending? Like <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's just, it, yeah, I mean, ever since civilization, there have always been people who are like, no, this is not going to, this is not going to last. <laughs> um, so the Millerites had, um, sort of fell out of favor after that. Um, but uh, Ellen G. White uh, was a, she took all of this stuff in. She grew up in a society waiting for the world to end. Um, and she had a traumatic brain injury that uh, kind of left her comatose for a really long time. I think also her father was a hatter. Uh, so she may have had like mercury poisoning. Interesting. Um, and one of the symptoms, one of the symptoms of mercury poisoning is visions and um, like, uh, you know, any number of different sort of comatose states that she would kind of fall in. Um, she convalesced after getting hit in the uh, head with a rock um, when she was young, uh, she convalesced at a Graham house, which is Sil uh, Sylvester Graham's house. Uh, Sylvester Graham was um, one of the early proponents of this idea of vegetarian America. Um, he tried to move everybody away from uh, abstaining from alcohol and moving over to a pri uh, pri primarily a vegetarian diet. Uh, he was anti-masturbation. He was anti-sex. Um, he, um, uh, and he was, he had a huge amount of influence on a number of different people. Um, uh, Louisa May Alcott, uh, his father, um, tried to build a vegetarian utopia. I think it was in Massachusetts called Fruitvale. Um, and then there was a place called Octagon City where, uh, in Oklahoma that they tried to build like a vegetarian paradise. Um, and every single one of them like failed, uh, Fruitvale, they almost starved to death. Uh, Alcott and her family almost start to death trying to live a vegan diet. Um, and so um, Graham's influence started to wane a little bit. Um, he actually tried to uh, start eating meat later on in life because he, he knew he was, um, he'd actually fundamentally ruined his health. Uh, but he ended up passing away. I think he was like 56 at the time. Oh, wow. But his influence, uh, his influence was definitely like still felt by the time uh, LNG White kind of comes into the picture. Uh, she starts to have all of these visions, uh, representations of the world ending. Um, she moves with her husband over to Battle Creek, Michigan, uh, where she sets up her original church. Um, and in that church, they um, there 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 is all of this stuff about. Uh, she kind of starts semi vegetarian. Um, she it adopts it much more as a symbol of uh, sort of a, a purity of existence that. Um, that would, in essence, sort of shuttle us into a new world. Uh, but she doesn't originally start out vegetarian. Um, she, she adopts that as like a uh, sort of methodology for proselytization and then for, uh, for the, a lot of the health and purity complexes that we see um, sort of ending in the 19th century. Um, her apprentice is like 12 years old, um, John Harvey Kellogg. Uh, his whole family were Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, Kellogg apprentices with her. So he's actually doing a lot of copy editing for her work. Um, she, most of her revelations um, years and years later were kind of found out that most of them were plagiarisms. Um, they, she took from a lot of uh, pseudoscience at the time, phrenology, weird, like uh, idealistic cults about purity. Um, she repackaged them and kind of sold them as revelations from God. Um, and so, John Harvey Kellogg goes off into the world. Um, he wants to become a doctor. He starts to, he, he actually apprentices in New Jersey with a guy uh, who does the water cure, which is huge, so prevalent around that time. Uh, essentially just enemas, um, you know, like purified water, um, you know, uh, enemas, like clearing, clearing out all of those toxins. He kind of comes back. He recognizes it's like, he's not really a doctor at this point. He just studied this. Um, he ends up going to New York City and he studies um, to become a doctor. He comes back. Um, he, one of his apprenticeships is at a hospital where um, you have a lot of uh, sexually transmitted diseases. So he sees syphilis. Um, you know, this is before antibiotics. Um, if you ever want to see the long term effects of syphilis, uh, watch The Nick, the HBO show. Um, they go through with this, uh, you just hor absolutely horrible. Your brain is eaten away, turns into Swiss cheese. Uh, you lose your nose, you lose like, um, it is an absolutely horrific disease. 
he decides he's never having sex. He's like, I'm out, <laughs> you know? Um, and he reads his, he like writes his treatise on masturbation and purity and all this stuff on his honeymoon. He claims he's never had sex with his wife in 40 years. Um, he, he lives the lifestyle of seven day Adventism. Um, and he's just a, just a really strange character. Um, him and his brother, uh, actually I think it was his wife, um, kind of start to work on breakfast cereals. Uh, they, they're trying to create, um, most breakfasts at the time were probably, um, leftovers from the night before. Uh, they were probably meat heavy, um, you know, any number of different things. He wants to create something that is a pure, uh, food, um, that doesn't have any taste, um, because he believes that fat, uh, meat and sensational foods like salt and spices, uh, you know, like will uh, inflame the passions and make people want to either touch themselves or want to have sex. He wants to remove that from people. So he creates the first like plant-based like meats as well. Uh, he creates the first cereal group. His brother takes all of that stuff and he turns it into a multi-million dollar empire. Uh, and then Kellogg becomes like this sort of de facto like celebrity for the purity culture that is at the time. Uh, the sanitarium itself became like a, you know, uh, presidents would go there, uh, celebrities, um, any number of different people who kind of worked on their health. Uh, he pushed a lot of that stuff. He never got rid of the whole enema thing. Uh, he invented a machine that would shove like 15 gallons of water per minute up your bum. Wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and, you know, everything is about this whole idea of purity, right? He, he got an enema every single day. He would chart his poop. Uh, he would, like, do any number of different things. Uh, he got heavily involved in eugenics, uh, the forced sterilization of peoples that he considered to be uh, defective. Uh, he was one of the biggest and, like, primary proponents of that. Uh, in the early part of the 20th century, he funded the Race Betterman Foundation um, and a lot of that stuff. The original science behind that, the sterilization procedures, um, the all of those things, in essence, became the legal representation um, and the uh, the um, the inspiration behind the Nazi eugenics program and sterilization program. Um, so a lot of that stuff stemmed from this idea of these purity cults who like really wanted to remove themselves from meat production and, um, you know, towards this other thing. Um, and so like I've studied Kellogg for a number of years, be just because I find him really interesting. Um, I, I think, uh, his legacy is mostly sort of greenwashed. Um, you don't get any of that sense when you look at the multinational, uh, corporation that is Kellogg. It's one of the biggest, you know, one of the eight. Um, you know, uh, largest multinational food companies on the planet. Um, the other ones are Nestle and Unilever. Um, Nestle is involved in a number of different, like, horrible, horrible, like, genocides and, you know, across the world, involved in child slavery. Unilever as well. Uh, they were implicated in the genocide of the Congo. Um, they, you know, these are these are companies that in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, is in essence establish the seed of what we actually live in nowadays, which is, you know, these, these companies that try to give themselves as the, like, uh, they're the ones who are going to take us into the future. They're going to build the sustainable food environment, which is ultra processed foods, shelf stable foods, uh, nutrient poor, uh, commodity products that they're just going to repackage and resell us in, in myriad different ways as like, you know, novel, interesting, you know, meat amalgams and all this other stuff. And then at the end result of that, like what you end up with is the food environment that we have nowadays, you know? And so you'll see these guys at UN Food S System Summit. You'll see them all over the place um, at every single governmental, uh, you know, uh, USDA, FDA, like, you know, um, uh, you know, product that comes out. Uh, they have enormous influence. They're one of the largest lobbying groups in Washington. Um, they're also one of the largest uh, lobbying groups in, in Western Europe. Um, they, they're pernicious and essentially everywhere. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, the story of Kellogg is just absolutely nuts. It's <laughs> so crazy. Reading some of his like original writings on the topic of sex and masturbation yep. is like, it's pretty dark, man. It's pretty heavy stuff to go back and read. Um, and, and I, I think I'm, I'm, 
accurate on this. I want to say maybe Belinda told me this, but it, it, when we think of what a current yeah. hospital is today, are we thinking the, like these are all things that John Harvey Kellogg created essentially, right? Yeah, I think, um, and Belinda's really the expert on all of this stuff. Um, I will uh, on at times find something that Belinda like, and you know, like uh, twice, I think twice, hey, hey, like five years of research, good. I found something that's that good. she didn't know about. Um, she is uh, the world's foremost, like uh, expert on seven day Adventist church. Um, the, uh, so she, she told me that uh, Kellogg's wife was uh, instrumental in the, uh, the sort of modern day nursing uh, it construct. Um, seven day Adventists, I think were, uh, in some ways sort of anti, uh, getting into and, um, uh, into the war itself. Uh, but they, they were instrumental in creating the framework for a lot of world war one going into world war two, um, nursing and, um, uh, and then and originally the dietetics program that was created, uh, was essentially a seven day Adventist church construct. Um, there is a paper online. It's pretty easy to find. Uh, it's called the global influence of the seven day Adventist church on diet. Um, it goes through it. You should probably just read the one paragraph where they kind of brag about, um, the, the, uh, the one thing that they added to the USDA program on diet, uh, and, um, it, where they inputted the original language that says, uh, a, uh, well, managed vegan and vegetarian diet is safe for all ages. Uh, they were the ones who originally kind of put that in there. And I think five of the nine original um, uh, dietetics group that got together, five of them were seven day Adventists. Wow. Um, Joan Sabate still like governs most of what's happening at the USDA in terms of their nutrition program. He's a seven day Adventist, um, you know, and, and the thing about it is like, you know, if you study Loma Linda, if you study the group that Blue Zones says is the model for the way to live in in, in America and have these centenarians and have these like people very healthy into um, the, you know, into their 70s. Um, the things that I find really interesting about that is the way, because the Seventh-day Adventist Church is really interesting in that they will tell you exactly what they think, <laughs> right? Yeah. They're not hiding it, right? They're bragging about it. Um, and so you read a lot of their work. Uh, Weeks was, I think, the grandson of Ellen G. White. He's written a number of books. Um, he says that specifically, we uh, zoning, allow, zoning laws didn't allow liquor stores um, in Loma Linda. It didn't allow fast food in Loma Linda. Um, and so they created a, an environment that was essentially like an encapsulated space that didn't allow for a lot of our modern food environment to kind of come in there. Yes, it may have been plant-based. It's hard to get a sense of what they consider to be uh, a vegan or vegetarian diet because I don't think um, they adhere to it as much as they say that they do. Um, but a lot of the research that says that they're, they're, the specific health outcomes of that, I think, are about creating that barrier sphere that doesn't allow for um, smoking, alcohol uh, uh, intake, and you know, also living in California, right? Sun exposure, exercise. They build entire like you know parks, and everything is centered around diet and exercise. So all of the benefits that they say is accrued to the vegetarian diet is also it, most of it. I think is just lifestyle. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's interesting to ponder too that Loma Linda was only added later as the fifth blue zone after the four were first established. After Dan Butner got involved, they needed to market this and sell his books here in America. So they added the fifth blue zone, which isn't like the other blue zones. It's not like people are born there, they live there, and they die there. This is a retirement community in a bubble, like you said, where there's things preventing yeah. them from from you know straying too far um, away from whatever their teachings are in that one area. So it's not really a blue zone where like in some of these other places. They, they're, they're born together, they live together, they all die together. It, it's totally out of context. They're only looking at one thing. You're looking at diet and emphasizing that, not emphasizing the other things. And it's so interesting to ponder what you mentioned earlier, that the, this religion is largely like invisible. Like I know one or two Adventists. I don't know that many. You don't see their churches all over the place, but the level of influence over the years and the chain of events that happened, you mentioned the dietetic schools, the diet, the, the nutrition certification book behind me that's 700 pages says nothing about Adventism, but it was the, the foundations of 
teachings around food, the, the foundations were laid in the 1910s by Seventh Day Adventists. So it's it's not mm-hmm. only that they have gotten themselves into incredible places of influence today, but they've been influencing things and setting those foundations for 100, 150 years. Yeah. So that it, it, when you say meat is part of a healthy diet, you're the crazy person. We're now going to hear from Dr. Anthony Chafee, somebody that we've hosted on our show three times. I've been able to hang out with Dr. Chafee. I've met him twice now. He's just such a stud, and he is so knowledgeable about human diets and how we've evolved. So this is taken from an episode that he and I actually recorded very recently. So be sure to look forward to that here in a few weeks. We'll be releasing that full episode. This is just a clip that is relevant to our discussion today. So let's hear from Dr. Anthony Chafee. The evidence that they cite is so weak and is so poor, and they know it, and they cite it and tell you that, which brings me to a debate that you did specifically. We did an episode with Aranda Wickramasinghe, um, who lives in the UK, who attended the conference that you were at, where we actually, I, I will say, ubiquitously across the board in the carnival world, this is the debate that we wanted to see. I heard it was really kind. Nobody fought. It wasn't, you know, rotten tomatoes at each other. Um, it was a really cool debate. And I, you were a part of it. I know you had to attend uh, virtually. You couldn't make it there in person, mm-hmm. kind of a last minute thing. But I would love to hear your experience. What was that like? And w- what were the arguments for a plant-based diet? And were they convincing at all? Oh, no, I, th- I thought it was very good. I mean, I think that's exactly, you're exactly right. I mean, we should be able to, to speak you know, cordially to each other. Um, that's not, that's not what a lot of, uh, these end up being, which is why there's, there's sort of no point in having them. Um, cause it's just a waste of time, you know? Um, it's just, just people are being just rude and childish and it's just like, well, why, why are we even doing this? Like, I don't, I have no interest in talking to someone if they're being, uh, childish about these things. And so this was nice. These, these people had, you know, mixed, mixed opinions. And uh, it was myself and Sean Baker leading up, you know, team, team meet and, and other people that were sort of in, in the spectrum of, uh, eating more plants to full on vegan vegetarian. Um, but everyone was, everyone was very good. We were able to, to, to go back and forth, you know, give our, give our spiel, make our case, and then sort of discuss the finer points of different things. Uh, it was a Dr. Chitty who um, made up the the main sort of vegan side of things. There's another gentleman who was I forget his name, but he was a he was a really interesting guy actually. I thought he had a lot of good points, but he wasn't like 100% vegan. He was just he was just saying there's probably benefits to eating plants. He's like, hey, there's there's good things here. Let's not let's not just throw them throw the baby out with the bathwater. And I, I you know I a lot of time for for that sort of discussion. You know, that's, that's totally, that's totally fair. Um, uh, Chitty, uh, you know, made some, some good points as well. I mean, he works in this in sort of a metabolic health practice and helps people and, and is getting people, you know, improving their health in a number of ways, but I didn't, I didn't find his, his arguments too compelling. One of his main pieces of evidence was, uh, talking about the China study, which I don't think is very, uh, compelling and, and has a lot of in it. And there are other people that have, you know, read the whole series of studies and China studies and things like that. Um, and actually sort of broken down the data and looked at it and actually found that they're, they're actually hiding things and, and, uh, and omitting major, major factors that, uh, really changed the story. And so, you know, people can look that up. It's sort of too long to get into, but, um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it justice, but you know, that was, that was, you know, it's like, it's like when someone comes and says, well, I mean the blue zone, so therefore plant-based, you know, it, it was sort of that sort of thing. And it's just like, well, there are major problems with the blue zones. Um, you know, I just, just did a podcast with Bill Schindler and he was in the blue zones and he was studying these people and, and how they ate and how they lived. And they were nothing close to plant-based. <laughs> they were nearly entire, well, they were definitely meat-based, whole animal-based and they ate, he said that they were eating more meat than he did at home. And, and he's always been big into meat. And, um, and then after, you know, after a week there, they said, Hey, we're going to have meat tomorrow. And he was just like, what do you, what do you mean? We're gonna have meat tomorrow. We've been eating more meat than I, I, I eat at home. Like, what are you talking about? What they mean by that is that mean they were going to put a whole animal on a spit 
and, and spend the whole day barbecuing and hanging out as, as a, as a community. Wow. Right. So that's what they mean. So when they, when the blue zones say, well, in Sardinia, they only eat meat once a week, they know damn well that they're being misleading. That's a, that's a difference in language. It's semantics. They say, we only eat meat once a week. Well, they're, they're saying you only eat meat once a week. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. We only eat meat once a week. That's what they call that. Right. So it's a, it's a, it's a confusion in the language and it's, and it's a purposeful, um, it's purposefully done by the people doing the blue zones because they, they know damn well that that's not the case, that that's not what they mean by that, that they predominantly eat meat. And, uh, and once a week they eat a lot of meat. Right. And so, and these people are extremely healthy and there are a lot of other factors in that. A lot of other factors, you know, have a strong tight knit community. People keep working. They have a goal. They have a purpose in life to keep them going. They're walking up and down a bunch of hills, going to their pastures, going to their herds, going to their animals, to tend them every single day and playing with their grandkids and their great grandkids and telling stories and, you know, doing, doing different activities and staying active and being busy and, and enjoying their life. A lot of beneficial things, but being plant-based is not one of them. That's right. Great. So, you know, that was, a, that was a major argument was, was, uh, the China study. Uh, sort of thing and going to Loma Linda and seeing these people that were a hundred and, you know, very healthy. And so it's like, well, that's great, you know, but um, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of issues with the Loma Linda um, crowd as well. And the Adventist studies are, are pretty biased, yep. very biased yep. as well. So, um, so, you know, it, it's, it's, it wasn't anything that I saw any new arguments that I was just like, Oh, okay, well that, that's, that's interesting. I'll have to look into that. And, you know, maybe that sort of shakes things around. It was, it was just sort of things I'd seen before. And I was like, mm, no, you know, we have, we have answers for these. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I heard from Aranda and I would have expected this to begin with that on the carnivore side, the arguments were very careful and logical and had proof and backing behind them. And the arguments for plant-based was more emotional. And this really helped my daughter heal this one thing mm -hmm. and it's great. And, and I'm so grateful for this and that that's fine, but it's, it's different than facts. I, I, it's, it's ironic too, because just this week we got a comment on a video that you and I did together where the, the person making the comment said, well, isn't it funny that every study says that eating more plants makes you live longer. And I'm like, I responded. I said, that's, that's cool. Like send me your favorite one. I'm actually talking to Dr. Anthony Chafee mm -hmm. this week. So I'll, I'll just bring it up with him. Like just send me whatever mm -hmm. your favorite one is. If all studies said it should be very easy to just come up with, you know, you're the best one that you like mm -hmm. and crickets. Like I didn't get any, I don't have any to discuss with you today because there was absolutely nothing. And I told him the same thing. Like if you're, if you're basing your, you know, knowledge of longevity on this new Netflix documentary called live to 100, that's all about the blue zones and Dan Butner and all of this stuff that's already owned by the, the seven day Adventist. If you're basing mm -hmm. your knowledge on that, there's a lot of gaps and we're doing a very specific episode on that coming up soon because it's, it's trending on Netflix. It's a top 10 show on Netflix. That's highlighting the benefits of the blue zones. And it's absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. Well, that's the thing, right? Because, because Dan Butner pushed a plant-based agenda. And, and so, you know, and I, I was actually, uh, on that, on the comment, comment thread on the Bill Schindler, uh, blue zone thing that I just put out. Um, there was a lady from Okinawa who just said, Hey, this is blue zones are crap. You know, I, I live in Okinawa. I grew up in Okinawa. My grandparents are a hundred and, uh, and they're very healthy. They mostly eat meat. They eat like 80% meat, 90% meat. And a lot of beef, a lot of pork and chicken and fish. And yes, they eat, they eat plants, but they, they don't, they don't eat much. It's the majority of what they eat is meat. And the majority of what I eat is meat and what my family eats are meat and what all the traditionally, uh, long living and, and the traditional diet of the Okinawans is a lot of meat. It's very meat heavy. So this is not true. And I, I know this, I grew up with this and, um, you know, a lot of people were very interested and in asking different questions. And then, you know, you had the sort of the, you know, the, the obligatory vegan trolls that, that tried to ignore everything she said and just say, well, yeah, but that's not carnivore. That's not hundred percent carnivore. So, I mean, what the hell is this all about? Like no one's saying it is, no one's saying it has to be. The point is, is that it's not plant-based. And so saying that the blue zones are so great because plant-based like that's, that's not true. And so, you know, it's just, it's just showing the actual facts of the matter and also showing that no, like eating more meat doesn't make you die young. 
right? That, that these people are predominantly eating meat. And if we're very convinced by their longevity and we're impressed by that, well, and we're, and we're going to look at their diet, um, you know, as something that we should model. Well, it's, it's meat-based. It's mostly meat. And, you know, the definition of a hyper carnivore, someone who gets over 70% of their calories from meat. So they're hyper carnivore, right? And so that's actually, you know, uh, pretty telling, but, you know, they wanted to ignore all that sort of stuff. But that's the thing is that um, the the blue zones were completely mis- misleading. And, um, you know, one thing that they did, the blue zone that they, they didn't mention, A, Hong Kong, that has the highest life expectancy on earth, eats more, more meat per capita than any other, you know, modern population. That's right. And, uh, and the, um, you know, the, the Adventists, now they say, well, they have a lot of centenarians as well, and they're all plant-based. I know a lot of that seven day Adventists and they say, no, that's not true. That's certainly what is pitched and what you you're supposed to eat is a lot of plant-based, but he said it was probably about 5% of people actually adhere to that. Everyone else just eats normally, you know, yep. uh, but what they do, uh, also, um, you know, encourage and, and impress upon their members is live a clean life. Don't drink, don't smoke, don't do drugs, don't have caffeine, don't have nicotine, um, you know, um, have, you know, ha- you know, get married, have kids, don't have, uh, you know, a, 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 this sort of real seeking life. And, um, you know, so that's, a, that's, again, a healthy user bias as a, as a population. And another population that they fail to recognize as a blue zone are the American Mormons who sort of adhere to similar um, restrictions as far as lifestyle is concerned, but don't have the nutritional restrictions that not even a lot of Seventh-day Adventists even adhere to. And uh, they have the exact same life expectancy as, as the Adventists. It's exactly the same as well, was, was last time I checked it was. But it's, you know, if it's not the same, it's very close. And so, you know, they they omit these sorts of things. And then what Dan Butner did was he actually sold the rights to calling things blue zones to the Seventh-day Adventists for right. tens of millions of dollars. And uh, now you have areas applying to be a blue zone, say, hey, look, we have all these centenarians, we have all these people that are living a long time, we want to be a blue zone. And uh, and they have to apply to the Seventh-day Adventist church and pay them a bunch of money. And then they decide, hmm, no, we don't like the look of that. You're not, you don't get the stamp, right? So this is this is a political thing now, you know, this is like, you get stamped as a blue zone. It's only the people that, that they want. They can maybe, I mean, I don't know, but you know, they could easily manipulate that. It's like, no, no, no. Like this is a cattle, cattle country. Just, we all just eat like, you know, a bunch of meat and steaks and everyone's living to be 110. Like, absolutely not. No, you know, we're not giving you a blue zone. Um, but, uh, you know, maybe they'll, they'll be honest about it, but I have, uh, you know, no, you know, no impression that they will, uh, based on, on previous behavior that they've done. Yeah. Fort Worth, Texas is one of those cities. I think they pay $6 million to the blue zone project to be accredited. Okay. Fort Worth, Texas is not a blue zone. I'm sorry. It's just not, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. And I heard, yeah, that the, the, the amount of money that the seventh day Adventist church bought the blue zones for was like 70 plus million dollars. It's crazy. Mm. I live here in the Salt Lake Valley. I was Mormon for a lot of my life. Um, and I have lived in the Salt Lake Valley for 38 of my 39 years. And I can tell you, they don't shun me. Like I'm I'm with these people. Mm. I've grown up with these people. That's how I grew up. And interestingly, I was actually thinking about this a few weeks ago. I wanted to know how much of this plant-based message that seems to be so publicized, how much of it is actually pushed in the Seventh-day Adventist church? I was just like curious, Mm -hmm. but I don't know any Adventists. They're a pretty small population. So I found the hotline that you could call the Seventh-day Adventist church to get in touch with some of their people that that know like the doctrine. And I just wanted to know like, how much is this pushed? I, I literally was on the phone for probably 30 minutes making, it was about 12 to 15 different calls that would always end up in either somebody's voicemail or I would hear, yeah, let me transfer you. Click, hang up. 
Oh yeah, let me transfer you. Click, hang up. It was the most bizarre thing. I finally found some woman receptionist in Reno that I was able to talk to. She was super friendly, and I was just like, "Hey, I like just have some like experiential questions to ask you. Like, do people talk about this?" And she was like, mm, "Like maybe one pastor, if he's really into it, might mention something, but it's not really something I do. I tried to go plant based ones, and it really sucked, and I didn't like it. Didn't work for me, so I don't mm. do it anymore. And it, it's not like a big part of their like actual message that they're." teaching their people. Mm. You're right. Like the people in the Seventh-day Adventist church don't necessarily follow that. Yet that's what's put on these Netflix documentaries and the Blue Zones as the major thing. It's so ridiculous. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that 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 was my impression from people I know in the Seventh-day Adventist church who told me that almost no one does that. It's like 5% of people are sort of hardcore or stick to the scriptures of um, of Ellen G. White, who was their prophetess, who said that she had a vision from God saying that meat was evil, causes lustful feelings, and lust is a sin, therefore meat is a sin, and you have to avoid it. Um, but, you know, <laughs> that, that that's not what most people adhere to. And, uh, but he said that, you know, it is, it is promoted. They say like, yeah, yeah, you know, from the church, you know, that you should do this and all that sort of stuff. But, um, but that not everyone actually does that. You know, it, it is funny too, because, there are a lot of well, the Seventh Day Adventist Church have had huge influence uh, in in nutrition. People should look up Belinda Fetke, F E T T K E, and look up her work with the, on the Seventh Day Adventist Church because it is absolutely mind blowing and staggering the influence that they've had over the past 130, 40 years. Uh, you know, they 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 founded Kellogg cereal, they founded Sanitarium Foods, they founded the American uh, Nutritional and Dietetics Association. They started, you know, the the, U- the university programs for um, nutritional sciences in America. They wrote one of the first textbooks in nutritional sciences at the university level in America in 1925. It's still in print in its most its current edition, right from the beginning, 1925. Plant based, plant based, plant based, plant based, plant based. You have to eat all these plants. And, uh, and they've had, they've had people in, I mean, because, because they were, they were there at the beginning, they helped found these institutions. And so they've had, they have very highly placed, uh, members, you know, there's 22, 23 million members. And, and most of people just, just normal, great people. But the, the, the doctrine from the top down is, is what it is and, and has been for a very long time. And so they've had these very highly placed People, you know, the McGovern report that was that was heavily influenced and even possibly written by a Seventh Day Adventist and say, oh, meat's bad, cholesterol bad. Oh, goodness, goodness gracious me. And um, uh, Dr. Pritikin of uh, the Pritikin diet. And this was this was the heart attack diet. You want to get on this this uh, heart heart disease prevention diet was the Pritikin diet. I mean, this was this was this was a, a household name at, at my house when I grew up. I knew who Dr. Pritikin was before I knew who the name of my own doctor was. Wow. And it was just Dr. Pritikin, oh, no, the Pritikin diet. No, we don't eat this. We don't eat fatty meat. We don't eat this. Okay, all right, I guess. And that, that was just that was just drilled into my head from, from infancy. And and uh, Dr. Pritikin was just like, just no fat, eat no fat at all. But it also said no sugar and no this and no that. No fat was no fat. And so that included like you know, seed oils and things like that. So got rid of the seed oils, got rid of the, of the sugars and, you know, whole food sort of approach to things. Uh, but he was considered the father of the plant-based diet because the meat that he was telling you to eat is like, okay, yeah, you can have meat, but you know, take ground beef, boil the living hell out of it, get all the fat out of it, then press it and smash it and press it and boil it again, drain out the fat, press it again, boil it, press it, boil it, press it, boil it, press it. I mean, what the hell is left? Oh my God. There's no, left. There's no flavor left. Um, you know, I mean, fat is long gone obviously but everything else is gone too it just tastes like garbage and so you know you just you just you know you're saying oh yeah you can eat meat you can eat that meat and we're like yeah no thanks i'll i'll do without you know um and uh you know and that was the thing he was a professor at uh, loma linda medical center the medical school uh which is the seven day adventist medical school i was looking at different medical schools uh, while i was living in california and I looked at Loma Linda, which is in California, and uh, and it said specifically, you must be a member of the Seventh Day Adventist Church in good standing to even apply. Oh wow! We won't even consider you unless you are in the church, and you have to have a letter from your deacon wow. saying what a good guy. And so I was just like, okay, don't know what that's about, but move <laughs> on. You know, I was, like, <laughs> I was like, I was like, well, maybe I can sort of, you know, 
fudge my way in and I guess I'm interested in the church and try to get a letter or something like that. I'm like, oh, who cares? I haven't even heard of this school before. <laughs> wasting my my time on it. And uh, but that that's you know. So I don't know if you have to be a Seventh Day Adventist member to teach there, but obviously you 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 need to you know at least be influenced by them. And, and Pritikin had read had said that he was heavily influenced by Ellen G. White and read all of her books. She had dozens of books. And um, and then Dr. Gundry, who I believe taught at Loma Linda as well. I don't know if he's a Seventh Day Adventist either, but you know he says, okay, you know, don't eat meat and all these things. But he wrote the Plant Paradox, and that's to me, it's just botany. That's that's what that's what I would have named that botany, <laughs> right? And um, but he called it the Plant Paradox. This is a paradox. You know, we we need to eat meat. This is the heavenly food from God. It's like manna from heaven, and you know, and obviously we can't eat meat. Meat's evil. Meat's shunned. Meat's a no-no. And so we should just eat eat plants. But there's this paradox because they don't want you to eat them, and they can kill you, and you can get really sick. And so maybe do it like this, or take this pill, or this supplement, or whatever. But you should still be plant-based, which is like not the conclusion I would have come to after writing that book. So silly, right? You know, but again, there's this influence from the Seventh Day Adventist Church. They got into his head too. He's a smart guy. He's a cardiothoracic surgeon, I believe, and wrote this book—a very, very accurate and and insightful book, talking about how plants do not want you to eat them, and they are toxic, and you should bloody well avoid them. And then, still, because he was sort of in that world, saying, "No, no, no," but you have to eat plants. Was this paradox? You know, it's like it's not a paradox. At all. Plants are toxic. We're not designed to eat them. We're not adapted to eating them because we've only been introduced to them very recently. And the food and the plants that we're eating now, even more recently, because those didn't even exist 10,000 years ago during the agricultural revolution. These things are brand new, right? So how can we be adapted or designed or benefited optimally by food that did not exist a couple hundred years ago? Some of these things didn't even exist 50 years ago or last year. Right? How is that the best thing for us to eat if it didn't even exist last year? Yeah, that makes no sense. It makes no sense. Law of biology is adaptation. We have not had time to adapt to this crap, and it's making us sick. Dr. Anthony Chafee is the awesome host of the Plant Free MD podcast, and I actually reached out to him to see if I can include some of the content that he created with another three-time former guest of ours, Dr. Uh, Bill Schindler. They just chatted about the Blue Zones because Dr. Schindler was just in one of the Blue Zones, Sardinia. And so they talked a lot about what his experience was like, Dr. Bill Schindler, as he was over there and experiencing the culture in that part of the world that we call a Blue Zone and say that they eat plant-based diets. So I got his permission, like I said, to use this clip from the Plant Free MD podcast. This was taken from episode 155. Be sure to go check out that podcast. It's absolutely wonderful. Go subscribe there and enjoy his awesome content. The main reason we went to Sardinia was to go make this egg corn bread with these, one of these women's sons. And it was actually fantastic to, uh, to see and witness and participate in. But the cool part is I didn't even realize that we were, I, I knew that Sardinia was uh, one of the blue zones, I didn't realize ahead of time that the area we were going into and spending a lot of time was actually the heart of the original first blue zone ever identified. Um, and obviously we all know the narratives about, um, you know, how it's very plant-based and, you know, this, this sort of thing we spent and uh, spent time with and lived with for several days, uh, a family that's been a part of that research, uh, was interviewed recently, not recently, but several years ago for a BBC special on the blue zones. And, uh, our main point of contact was a woman who's written the most books about the history of Sardinian food and traditional Sardinian food. So this is what we're immersed in. And what I can't wait to tell you about is what we did and how animal based all of it was and how they were sitting there just laughing. Like I, what is this thing about? They, they recorded us eating minestrone soup. Like, what is what what, what is yeah. this thing about all these plants? And um, so, anyhow, we go and we uh, well, we 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 landed in, uh, in Rome, and actually, I, I got to tell you this one thing very very quickly. We landed in Rome, and our flights changed. We had a nine hour layover in Rome, so I uh, contacted a buddy of mine that lives in Rome as a chef, and he took us to this restaurant that is focused on offal and it's from the late 1800s. And it, it, uh, 
it popped up. It, it was a couple that was making and selling wine or something. And they realized across the street, they were just about to put a huge slaughterhouse in. And they said, we're going to start a restaurant across the street from the slaughterhouse that uses all the stuff that they're not selling, like everything else. And it was brilliant. It's been around since like 1894. And we had a dish I always wanted to have in Rome. It's a traditional Roman dish where they take uh, the intestines of the animals. Uh, it's a calf's and a veal calf intestines. Un- so it's unweaned and it's a small intestine. So after the animals drink the milk from their mothers, it goes into their stomach. It gets hit with a bunch of enzymes, starts to change and actually is turning into cheese in their stomachs. And then when it goes into their small intestines, they, uh, you know, they, they, the animals killed and they take the small intestines and don't even wash it out. Right. I mean, here is just an, a milk fed animal with self-made cheese inside of the intestines and they literally chop it up and they, and, and they serve it. I am telling you, it was absolutely delicious. I mean, it was, I mean, I'll eat these things because I, I want to try them. This is a dish I would go over and over again and order. It's, it's actually one of the best things I've eaten in Rome. You wow. would love it. Yeah. And so that, that's the cheese in the, the intestine itself, or do they take the cheese out? No, it's in there. They don't even clean it out. So it's not the large intestines. You know, stuff in the large intestines is a different thing. You know, it's the small intestines, right? So it's it's undigested self-made cheese. It actually, it was like a carnivore version of uh, manicotti. I mean, it was like, it, it, the intestines were very mild. I mean, it was a veal kit. It was very mild and had a pasta-like quality to it, but it was intestines. And the inside was like, you had filled it with ricotta cheese. It was amazing. And actually, Christina had it too, my wife, and, and she she thought it was delicious as well. So we go there first. That was the first meal we had in Italy this trip. And then we fly to Sardinia, and then we went up, and we drove through the mountains and, and got to this little village of Villa Grande. Now, Villa Grande is the epicenter of the first identified blue zone. And, and the part that is documented correctly is there's a lot of old people. <laughs> I mean, a lot of old people. And the part that I love is that it wasn't like there's a bunch of old people and you go to the nursing home to see them. There's a bunch of old people all over the place. And the, the family we were with, uh, Marco, his father is 98 years old. Every day he, he walks up and down the mountains, like all day, um, every single day. Next door to them, their neighbor is 103 years old. He lives by, him ha- by himself in a, in a several story house. And he lives, his main residence is on the second floor of this house. So this guy's going up and down, 103 years old, up and down steps every day. Villa Grande has literally, the, and, and they have a big sign when you drive into it. They still hold the record for the uh, most amount of, uh, centenarians that are male, which is a, obviously a big deal, right? So there, there, it's true. There's a lot of old people, but the dietary part of it is 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 wrong. So um, we did, and, and and again, as many of us know, but it's nice to have you know firsthand experience with this. Yeah. A couple things that are uh, I think really important. Um, now, listen, they did eat vegetables, not a lot, but they did. Everybody had a little orchard. Um, like literally everybody has a little orchard. The the village is, is kind of concentrated on the side of this mountain, but the village itself has a whole lot of land around it. And there's areas where they pasture their animals. There's areas where they have little orchards and things. So they do eat a little bit of vegetables and not a ton. I mean, they, they eat tomatoes, obviously. Um, uh, that was the main one. Uh, <laughs> they eat tomatoes and some more tomatoes. The ripe fruit is something that the, that they'll eat as well. But Every time that we sat down, and I think this is very important, every time that we sat down to a meal or entered somebody's house, everybody had pigs and everybody cured their, butchered their own pigs and cured their own meat. So literally every time we visited somebody, I don't care what time of day it was, they hold one and they run away and they come back and they put down a platter of this amazing house cured meat. And I mean, these are meats that they're making without nitrates their own animals. Um, it's, it's usually was prosciutto and salami and copa and pancetta all out on this tray and they give it to you. And it's, this part I think is fascinating. So what am I about to tell you? The Sunday that we were there, the first Sunday we were there with this one family, they're like, okay, you know, we're, we're going to have meat today. We're going to have meat. I said, okay. And they put an entire half a sheep with all the intestines on this kind of rotisserie thing in their big, um, they had a fire out back, kind of a big fireplace. And they, and they had this thing uh, all day on, on the spit and they made us this grandiose meal, but it was all built around this half of a sheep that they spent all day cooking. 
And they said, yeah, we're having meat today and the barbecue. We're going to barbecue. And they, they put it down and we ate it. It was fantastic. And then a few days later, uh, but it started with the charcuterie. It started with the salumi and then, and then it went to that later and a whole bunch of other food. But that was the basis of it. And a couple of days later, we were talking. And this was hard talking because my Italian is terrible. Um, not many people in Sardinia speak English. And they and in fact, Sardinian is there is the basic language and Italian is, you know, there as well. So we, we had translators, but it, everybody was amazing. And I said, you yeah, what's the story with this this meat thing? You know, how, do, how often do you eat meat? No, and, uh, you know, it's reported that you eat meat once a week. They said, yeah, yeah, we eat meat, meat once a week. I said, wait a second. I have eaten more meat with all of you over the past several days than I even eat at home. Like, what are you talking about? Said, when they say eating meat, they meant the entire day barbecue on Sunday where there's a half an animal on the spit. But it's the semantics here are really, really important. You're, they're eating meat all day long, but they, what they were, you know, that, that saying like, let's have a big family barbecue picnic is, is, is what they meant. So the, every Sunday they have this huge, huge meal of meat, but they're eating meat all week long, massive amounts of meat and a lot of cheese. And the cheese is off the charts. Amazing. Well, you've heard her name come up already a few times, so let's hear from the world-renowned expert in all of this stuff, Belinda Fecky. We've been able to talk to her a few times on our show. This is taken from a clip on episode 384, and she will be able to go into much greater detail about the Blue Zones here. I don't know. It, it's just, it's so interesting to see how all that impacts us today in 2022 still because of everything that's happened and because they still want to move that message yeah. forward and they're not trying to hide it. That's exactly right, Casey. It, until you look back into history, you cannot understand where the plant bias messaging is coming from in today's society. You honestly can't. And I think that was what I was just blown away with when I started looking at sanitarium here in Australia, owned by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And as an aside, they pay no tax because it comes under the charity status of the church. So they pay no tax. I imagine worldwide on their 21 food industries which produce over two and a half thousand different products to take the place of flesh meat, milk and butter. And they, in Australia, Sanitarium pays no tax on their health and wellness programs, which they run in church and communities and in corporate businesses. And, and the Sanitarium um, health and wellness programs are run in America as well. So you know, it's like they're a hub. I, I say the footprint's really small but their influence is massive. And sanitarium doesn't just go to America, it goes to Asia, um, the UK, and out into the South Pacific. Their influence out there, specifically with health and wellness programs, with their 10,000 Toes campaign, but it's, it's under the umbrella of sanitarium. So people don't question because it's not under the umbrella of the church. Yep. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, it's how they get this message through. I was saying yesterday, you know, they're the second biggest educators in the world despite the fact there's only 21 million people actually as part of the church. So it's not a big church and yet their influence is massive and health and wellness education is just such a big part of this um, messaging. So I, I'll jump back to 1844 just quickly so people get a little bit of an idea. Um, William Miller said it was going to be the end of the world in October 1843 and then when they reworked a few of the numbers it became October 1844. Ellen G. White was part of a group. She was 17 years old at the time in 1844. <clears throat> Jesus didn't come back. Apparently there were 100,000 people who were completely believing that this was going to happen. Wow. Some people had sold their houses. Some people, many people had given up their work. A lot of people, most people had given up their other church you know, a lot of church goers, they'd given up their churches and come to be part of this Millerite movement. They were really thinking it was going to be the end. And so, oh my gosh, suddenly it wasn't the end. Ellen G. White had a vision that the, it wasn't the wrong date, it was the wrong event mm. <clears throat> to explain it all. So this is where the Seventh-day Adventist Church was born out of this great disappointment. Her vision, God told her she was taken to heaven. She was told that atonement wasn't completed at the cross. 
which is what the Second Testament identifies. You know, this is this is what Martin Luther was talking about when he did the Reformation. It's about faith, and this happened at the cross. Ellen G. White said, no, 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 it didn't. It started there, but only a little bit. What happened was in 1844, Jesus moved from his holy place to his most holy place. He went to the second apartment, and there he started his work. And I was saying to Jake and Marin, you know, the scary part is for a lot of people in the Seventh-day Adventist church is you don't know. So say that your name came up yesterday, Casey, and Jesus went through and, and blotted out your sins, but you don't die for another 20 or 30 years. You have no intercessor in that time because your name's already been ticked off. So in that entire time, you are being considered, you know, have you sinned? Have you said the wrong thing? Have you done all these things? I believe that's why works are so important as part of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, why people have to be part of this medical evangelistic outreach. They say it's total member involvement. It isn't just the doctors. It isn't just dietitians. It isn't just nurses. It's every single person in that church has to be part of this medical evangelism and take it to a level where they can. So whether it's just talking to your neighbour about healthy cooking or vegetarianism or veganism, whether it's having you know, cooking classes, whether it's doing all these things, whether it's running this chip program. And if you look at the facilitator guide, it's got meat, eggs and dairy above alcohol and processed food as the, as the, the toxins that provide the worst health outcomes. So every single person is immersed in this belief and immersed in telling this because when they tell this story, when enough people give up meat, as we've spoken about, or are aware of it and can make the conscious decision. Again, the church founded religious liberty. They were the ones who started the Sentinel magazine in the 1800s. They were the ones that founded the, the International Religious Liberty Association. No, and part of that was to protect themselves from the Sunday blue laws that were being talked about as being brought in. But they also wanted to become non-combatants in the Civil War. There's a whole lot of reasons that they began this religious liberty, but it's carried on today and people probably don't realise it's the church. They actually allow other church members or other people to be um, the president of the International Religious Liberty Association, but they're the CEO and they're most of the board members. Wow. You know, it's still very much protecting the Seventh-day Adventist church beliefs. Wow. That's what it's been set up to do. But they allow people to have choice and so they are protecting other religions as well and this idea that it's a moral choice that you decide you're going to give up all of these things because that means that you are spiritually pure right. and flesh meat ellen g white taught flesh meat defiled people not only men but women and children and it defiled them spiritually physically and morally so you know this is a really really powerful statement and if you consider I've mentioned that this their diet wasn't possible till different foods were invented well John Harvey Kellogg invented these foods and his father had been part of the church from the beginning he didn't send his children to school John Harvey Kellogg didn't go to school because his father they just kept teaching it's about to be the end of the world they're an apocalyptic church Ellen G. White taught that it was going to happen in her lifetime. Jesus was going to come back. And the reason they blame that he hasn't come back is because not enough people have given up meat. <laughs> this is why he's not coming back. So you, you look at John Harvey Kellogg, he was only 12 years old when he went to work for the first family of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. He was 12 when he was typesetting her sermons, her testimonies to the church, and also this book, um, A Solemn Appeal to Mothers. In this book, she spoke only of mums, mothers deterring their children from masturbation, and she blamed meat as the major cause. Not the only cause, but the major cause. And so imagine being a 12-year-old. I don't know if you remember what it was like when you were 12. <laughs> Very impressionable and, and, and also um, quite worried about the world at 12. You know, you're just starting to become a little bit of an adult. You're losing some of your childhood beliefs. and coming out into the world and writing that meat will cause epilepsy, blindness, a decaying head, inwardly decaying head, 
And she had the words and he had typeset as if you put a pistol to your heart and took your own life. Crazy. Blame, blamed it on everything, um, becoming an imbecile, you know, just a whole lot of scary things, criminal behaviour. So here's a young boy. Is it any wonder when he grew up? And they paid for him to become a doctor. They paid for his medical education. That his life was spent creating foods to take the place of flesh, meat, milk, and butter and marketed as health food. <laughs> it's just one of my favorite sayings from Tom Clancy, a fiction writer, who says it, it, the only difference between fiction and nonfiction is that fiction has to make sense. That's why this story is just so bizarre. <laughs> but people hear it and they go, wow, I, like it makes sense to them. It, it, it's outlandish, but it also makes sense. It explains so many it makes sense. different things. And maybe this is a good time to introduce the Blue Zones. What in the world does all of that stuff have to do with a few demographers looking at places around the world where people seem to live a little bit longer that morphed into this concept of Blue Zones? How do, how do those two things converge? I love this idea. I think I've looked a lot at ancestral health and certainly the First Nations peoples here in Australia and how they're very much connected spirit to people, people to place and place to culture. They have 65,000 years. They think they're probably one of the oldest continual living cultures in one place. And they were very much in, you know, they, they cared about the land and they realised they had to save and protect areas. They had to protect animals at different times in their lives. You know, their, their whole thing was, you know, we're part of a circle, which I guess I loved with... Um, this concept of death in the garden, you know, it's about birth and death and rebirth and, and looking at this continual circle. This is what the First Nations people in Australia were just totally committed to. And that is why when Western A. Price came in the 1930s, he came to Australia, he was just blown away. He'd found pockets of communities all around the world that had health and longevity. And in particular, the Australian Aboriginal people were just, they had beautiful jaws, they had phys they were physically fit, physically well, and he was just amazed at the land that they had um, cultivated. Well, cultivated, they didn't cultivate it. They they protected and and nourished as part of this circle of life. And so, I guess the blue zones came a little bit about from I would think from Western A. Price's work, where he found these pockets of people that were unaffected by industrialized Western food. So in in 1999, I think that um, Giovanni Pess and uh, Michel Pula had been looking at how do we consider this health and longevity? You know, where we, we're looking at people who maybe are centenarians and super centenarians. They really wanted to try and explain the, as a demographer the geography, the culture, all sorts of things to help explain why some people appeared to have this amazing ability. And so they looked specifically at um, Sardinia in Italy. And as they were looking at this area, they were using a blue highlighter pen and the blue highlighter pen just ended up covering this entire space. So that's how it became the blue zone. And, and they made the comment about Sardinia in particular that there were no Western hospitals there. There was no hospital in this area where there were super centenarians. So they were discussing the concept that these people had ancestral diets. They were self They were isolated communities. They were self-sustaining communities. They were growing crops. They were tending to their livestock. They were fishing. They were doing all of those things. So they're eating unprocessed food. <laughs> they were part of a very close-knit community. They were out in the fresh air. They were lots of things. Interestingly, they didn't get a lot of sleep in Sardinia. They were quite a, um, a, a group of people. Well, maybe they slept in in the mornings, but they stayed up late at night and, uh. and had a lot of community, uh, quite a bit of drinking, and, and they had a lot of celebration times. You know, they were quite involved where they'd share their food. But this food included raw milk from sheep and goats that they tended. It included fish. It included pigs and lard. And... And I think when I looked into this blue, oh, sorry, into the blue zone areas that they were they were looking at, we've got Okinawa in Japan, we've got Nakoya in Costa Rica, and Icaria in Greece. And they determined these four areas in particular seem to be really suiting their their concept 
of community, um, isolated, small communities that really relied on each other and relied on the produce that they were able to grow and produce and um, access. They then made the comment that potentially these groups then had some access to some Western medicine, maybe in their 70s or 80s, that gave them that extra benefit because when they looked at people who were younger and who'd already had access in these communities to processed foods, their life expectancy was nothing compared to these people they'd found were already centenarians or super centenarians in 1999. So, you know, we're talking about a longevity pill that maybe doesn't even exist anymore. In 2004, Dan Butner contacted, was contacted by National Geographic, or he contacted them, I'm not sure which, and they determined that, you know, where's this longevity pill? You know, we've heard some research being produced about these blue zones. How can we sell this, I would think? How can we sell this to America? How can we sell this to the world? And so, you know, where's the fifth blue zone? Hmm, California? Uh, How did you know? Convenient. (laughs) Convenient. Loma Linda is the fifth blue zone that Dan Butner identified. And unlike the other blue zone areas, this blue zone is um, affluent. They're very poor. Those other blue zones are so poor, but rich in culture, rich in um, what the land will produce and very rich in um, family connections and whatever else. These people are affluent. They didn't live in Loma Linda all their lives. Most of them have come in as retirees, not all, but a lot of the, certainly the people who've got this incredible longevity. And I'm not denying that there are some very healthy Seventh-day Adventists who have gained incredible longevity. And again, as we discussed, you know, maybe they included a little bit of animal proteins and fats in their diet. Certainly this community that they come into, into Loma Linda, is so supportive of no cheat days. (laughs) No, no, this, no, that. You know, they really are very supportive of how they can be the healthiest they can be. But in speaking to people in <clears throat> poorer areas that have belonged to the church, their health is nowhere like they're claiming in Loma Linda. Wow. So I consider this a region. They're trying to make it a a culture, and so they're labeling all Seventh Day Adventists, and they're labeling their diet as the health and wellness component, but I believe it's Loma Linda that's the health and wellness component of a very select few people. Four and a half thousand people are employed at the at the Seventh Day Adventist um, University Church uh, University um, Hospital, so it's a lot of people who are living there that are working for the church as well. But I think you know this is really challenging. In two thousand and nine. Dan Butner wanted to commercialise the Blue Zones. So he and Giovanni Pess and Michelle Puller created the Blue Blue Zones project and it's a copyrighted brand now. This is the pill that everyone wants. So they wanted to create this Blue Zones project and and it includes the elements of fresh air, walking, um, reducing, uh, certainly smoking, and alcohol consumption, but if you look at the other blue zones, they don't necessarily reduce alcohol, but certainly the Loma Linda is zero alcohol. Um, and they just tried to tweak the findings, I guess, to create this plant slant diet, 95% plants. I mean, wait a minute, every single other blue zone included lard in cooking. They didn't have trans fats and polyunsaturated oils, they used lard. Loma Linda, part of the Seventh-day Adventist church, they follow, they talk about the Garden of Eden diet, fruit, nuts and seeds, but they do follow the clean and unclean meats of the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy. So pork is unclean. They do not use pork lard. Somehow they've convoluted, and people in Okinawa aren't going to complain, people in Sardinia aren't going to complain, This is an American project that they've tweaked the messaging and people hear, 
blue zones, longevity, you know, you, you click to all of those places and they've created this amazing utopia and then suddenly plonked it all in Loma Linda and wanting to set it out to the rest of America. You know, we can sell your community a blue zone. And I think I mentioned to you in 2018, I found a document, actual um, document of the contract, and it was going to cost six and a half million dollars for one small city, or yeah, it probably was a small city, to become a blue zone accredited. Wow. So that is, if you think about it, surely that's just consulting. It wasn't, that was just the consulting fees and an accreditation. It wasn't changing the landscape it wasn't creating bike paths it wasn't doing all those other things it was just how the community was going to do it so it must be a bit of a blueprint you know uh, my daughter's a change management consultant and, and while you do slightly different things for each business there's a template that you follow I can't imagine it's going to cost them six and a half million dollars in consulting fees to create this template for a community to adopt these blue zone things but that's how much it was going to cost in and so because they're really promoting the Seventh-day Adventist church as Loma Linda and being a blue zone, the church has been very behind this whole promotion. And in 2020, they, they love it so much, then in 2020, Adventist Health bought the Blue Zones project. They bought the rights to it. So now Giovanni Pess, Michelle Pooler, Dan Butner are not only sitting back from them selling the project for so long, but now Adventist Health is paying them to have this project. And if you look at the website, you know, they say we want to get this Blue Zones community project out into every um, community on the West Coast, everywhere that we're involved, you know, all up the West Coast into Hawaii, this is what we're going to do. And that's a big, audacious um, idea. But last year in 2021, there was the 89th US Congress of Mayors. And this Congress is, um, I think, 1,400 mayors attended and you have to have at least 30,000 people in your community to be able to be part of this. And they passed the resolution that they were going to adopt the Blue Zones in their communities. And the thing is, when these mayors pass a resolution, it goes to Congress and it's accepted as policy by the government. Wow. So you haven't just got the blue zones running up the West Coast. Now you've got 1,400 mayors who've said, yes, we're, in, we're doing this. And do people understand? And I think this is my challenge. I'm not anti-vegan. I'm not anti-vegetarian. I'm not anti-religion. I'm pro-choice, especially when it comes to health. And having understood how this ideology of the Seventh-day Adventist Church has silenced my husband has impacted dietary and health guidelines worldwide and now creating medical and dietetic education and now the blue zones, you know, this is, this is where's the transparency that this is an ideology that's come about from a vision from God claimed by a woman in 1863. Do people realise that or are they just caught up in the hype and the media? And I think this is such an important thing to discuss and do all these mayors realise it? I don't think they do. But at the moment, the media is pushing this plant-based message as being the best thing for people in planetary health. It's the perfect opportunity for the Adventist church to use their entering wedge. Yeah. Wow. That's so crazy. What a nice gig. I mean, to be working for National Geographic, to get in on this project, sell, I want to say nine or 10, like best-selling New York best-selling books, whatever. Um, and then have this project that people are paying into that your town can get certified. And it is, it is interesting to look at his work. Like it looks decent. There's nine different kind of pillars of health Absolutely. that they talk about. They talk about community, the importance of having, um, a role and you know, you keep, you keep the grandparents in the house. They help raise the kids. They can help cook. Yeah. They do all kinds of stuff. We know, I, I heard recently, Dr. Tommy Wood talking about when, when we retire, the concept of retirement uh, right, right off the bat is very, very young. But when you retire, if your plan is to just sit around and sit on a beach, like you're, you're not going to need your brain anymore. And it's a really expensive yeah. organ. It's going to start to, to, to lessen its function for sure. 
He talks about walking, which is amazing. It's one of the best things you can do. The fresh air that you mentioned, getting outside, all that stuff is great. Mm -hmm. Number four, I want to say it was number four is like eat a moderate amount. So stop when you're 80% full. Number five is eat a plants based diet. Like, okay. Yeah. Then you, then that, that part is all they really talk about. They emphasize and hit that so hard. And then when you look into, okay, what are you recommending for a plant-based diet? You go to a, another link, you see a pyramid yes. looking thing. You're like, okay, what's this about? At the top of the list is to avoid meat. Don't eat meat. It's recommendation is to have a two ounce piece of meat five times a month. I'm, and I'm, I'm thinking about this, like, okay, what is, what is two ounces for you to visualize this? Two <laughs> ounces is a golf ball. Have one yeah. golf ball size serving of meat five times a month. The next one is avoid dairy. And there's no real details about that. The next one is have no more than three eggs a week. So you're eating 10 ounces of meat a month with 12 eggs spread out across that month. <sighs> Give me a break. <laughs> exactly. And it's not what the original blue zones ate. So I think that's, that's the challenge. And yet if you talk about blue zones, it just seems to be common sense because it's been marketed and so cleverly that people think it is a plant-based diet. Well, the blue zones is plant-based. The funny thing was, you know, when Gary started talking about health and nutrition, he said to me, because I'm a photographer, I do graphic design and different things, he said, can you please paint me a blue zones map? You know, it's really important. The blue zones is health and longevity and they're, they're eating meat and all these things that and I created this blue zone thing I was like Gary you were marketing the Adventist church <laughs> 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 I had no idea but he was seeing the blue zones as um Weston A. Price was seeing the blue zones you know um Sally Fallon's written some amazing stuff about the blue zones and incorporating animal proteins and fats in the diet he hadn't looked at Loma Linda the American version of the blue zones um, to understand this plant-based diet when he got me to make this map for him. But I did laugh when I <laughs> did my research. I was like, why are you pushing the blue zones? <laughs> so advertise for it, them anymore. Yeah, it, you know, again, that's the perception. And I think how interesting is that? Gary had looked at Western A. Price's version of the blue zones, interpretation of um, Giovanni Pess and Michelle Puller's work, and then you've got Dan Butner's interpretation. So you can be talking about the same blue zones. You know, this is them. He even had Loma Linda highlighted. You know, they sleep and they do all these other things, hadn't thought about the diet so much. So I think, you know, we're being health washed. Continuing our conversation here with Belinda Fetke, we're actually going to go to an earlier episode where we were able to talk to not only her, but her husband, Dr. Gary Fetke. Um, they both appear in this episode, which the original was uh, episode 314. And I think this will just give a little bit more nuance to the conversation. And it just kind of reinforces things to hear both of them talk about this. Surely those things can be left in the past. They don't affect mm -hmm. us now. You know, maybe they have those one or two mm -hmm. universities or whatever. I can think of Loma Linda. I can't name any other institution that's owned by them, yet there are thousands and they get into <laughs> the guidelines and have been in the guidelines. Can, can you explain like how, how it was that their influence way back then still impacts us in a way that's far greater than most people imagine today? Well, they... They're they, they, this they, is, they, this they, is they, their commission. They've been commissioned by God. Commissioned. And, so, and so therefore they have been, they, they don't go to war, they don't take up arms, which is quite nice because if you're going to take them on, we're they're probably the one religion which is least <laughs> likely to come along and kill you. <laughs> That's good. <clears throat> we Chris, hope. Christianity doesn't have a good history when it comes to that. So <laughs> No, no, I know. So we, we, we do respect them for that belief. <clears throat> we encourage that one. But then... Um, the, the medical uh, evangelism is the right arm of the church. So they have been working and putting their people and supporting them up the, the tree for decades. You know, the, <clears throat> their, their business model for getting this across has been in action for 100 years, and more than 100 years. And medical evangelism <clears throat> and that health reform <clears throat> message. So that... You know, they, they, they were able to move vegetarianism as an acceptable form into the guidelines. But when you actually looked at the people in the US one, 
and the Australian one, when they had those position papers, they were all virtually Seventh-day Adventist members, bar one from the food industry. You've got to drill down to what Belinda drilled down for that. And so they've... <clears throat> They keep positioning themselves generation upon generation. And then so therefore they've got this political model which has been very effective and they've been able to move into the guidelines. But they've also got a business model which has been coming along beside that. Mm. And here in Australia they don't pay taxes. So all of their profit <coughs> literally goes Not the into people, <coughs> the commercial church. The commercial church literally goes into continuing this health and well being message. It's a sanitarium here in Australia are the health and well being company. It's registered. And, they, you know, they're one of Australia's most trusted companies because they tell us that they are. <laughs> and, and if you keep repeating this message. <laughs> you believe it. People, if you keep hearing it, like it's in Reader's Digest, it's in the, it just keeps coming at you. <clears throat> we're the health and wellbeing company. It comes across all the time. You know, they were the ones that wrote the algorithm here in Australia for the health star rating which actually surprisingly supports their processed food yeah. so that therefore they get four to five stars for their highly processed food and uh, full-fat yoghurt gets one. That's because they <laughs> demonised animal protein and fat. And mm. so, when, but, you know, in the, in the supermarkets when you go there, they've got the health star rating on the food and the health star rating supports their product. So that's what they'll advertise and gets four stars. Those ones that you know, full-fat doesn't actually have a health star rating on it because... They get ba get bagged out by this industry. They it, and and it's continued on to the education. So therefore, then you get the medical students being taught it. You get the nutrition students, the dietitian students, and they just keep believing this. We've actually gotten hold of the te well, sorry, used and looked at the textbooks that the dietitians here in Australia learn from currently. Yeah, and they. It, it's, it doesn't actually even refer to meat in it. It does, it, it does with meat. There's one reference with meat in a table and then two references to mad cow disease. And they <laughs> didn't even realise because the education <clears throat> has become so siloed into little areas that they hadn't seen or realised that they were being educated about the demonisation of animal proteins and fats uh, subconsciously. It's, in, it's really interesting. And so when I looked at this man, Mark Walquist, and what he was actually doing, the expert witness for APRA, um, he was part of the IUNS, which is the International Union of Nutrition Science. He was the president from 2001 to 2005, and at the end of his presidency, he organised for a meeting in Gissen um, in Germany, and they had this meeting where they determined, and I'm saying they, and it included Esther Vorster, who was the nemesis in Tim Noakes's case, Okay. And it included Joan Sabat, who was part of the US 2020 Dietary Guidelines Committee as a devout Adventist with the, the same belief. So we've got three people, we've got actually many, many people, but these three that are very clear in my mind, creating a document and signing a declaration there that they were going to include planetary health into dietetic education. And by putting diet, planetary health, the concept, that was the way then they could bring into dietetics, and that was early 2000s, that was the way they could really substantially demonise animal proteins and fats <clears throat> in the dietetic education. If we go back to the 1960s <clears throat> when the Adventist health studies were started, a lot of people heard about the Adventist health studies, they, they keep repeating them, but they effectively they keep reciting themselves as being proof that a vegan vegetarian lifestyle is actually most beneficial. If you then go, if you go back five to ten years before that, Harry China Miller was a doctor who worked, did a lot of uh, uh, reform work, did a lot of work in China, but also set up a whole lot of soy industries in China, <clears throat> and then brought that whole soy product to the U.S. He came back to the U.S. and set up research laboratories to prove the visions of Ellen G. White. Not disprove it. Not to disprove it. <laughs> Science is all about disproving your hypothesis. You know, it, here's your hypothesis. Let's try and prove it incorrect. Whereas he came back and set it up to prove that visions were correct and flowing on from that were the Adventist health studies, which were done to <laughs> prove 
something, not to disprove it. And then they keep reciting it. Each of the Adventist health studies has been recited over 400 times by themselves. So if you look up citations, it's incredibly well cited and therefore because it's repeated over and over and over and over, you know, I've, I've looked at the, you know, the Mormons actually have a, a greater longevity in the US than the Adventists do. That's right. Now, if you look at, you know, they, and so do the Ashkenazi uh, Jews. It's there, the data is there, but you don't hear about the Mormons and the Jews outliving everyone else. All you hear about as Adventists at Loma Linda as part of Blue Zones, which is, it's again, just made That's up. Another <laughs> Beware <laughs> the Blue Zones, can I just say. Beware the Blue Zones. I, I uncovered um, last year there was the 89th US Congress of Mayors and at that Congress, 1,400 mayors have just signed and passed as official policy the adoption of the Blue Zones. And that's really scary in America. And someone said to me recently, why do you know so much about America? But I can't help myself. It's easy, easier to find it there than it is here. So the concept of the Blue Zones, the Blue Zones, sorry, project, the branding of the Blue Zones was bought by Adventist Health in 2020. It's, and it's, now you've just had 1,400 mayors <laughs> sign up to Great. say, yes, we're going to do this. Great. And when you look at their graphic about what you eat, it's called a plant slant diet, 95 to 100% plants. That's what they believe the Blue Zones ate. But the demographers didn't say that. It was Dan Butner in 2005 who found Loma Linda as a Blue Zone a journalist, and he's he and the couple of demographers branded this because you couldn't create a pill for longevity. Fountain of Youth have been looking at forever, could not find a pill to create that. So they worked on creating a concept that they believe crossed all of the boundaries or picked the best of each of these different areas, but they took the, they took the diet from Loma Linda. And that was the thing that they said, yes, this is what we need to pull in, which does not agree with well, the <laughs> Sardinia and um, Okinawa, right. where they had Icaria. Th those other, <laughs> the original, sorry, the original Blue Zone areas. All ate lard. All ate lard, <laughs> all ate animal proteins and fats. But, in fact, the original one wasn't actually, that wasn't a study of diet. It was a study no. of culture. Sure. Yes. Yeah, that's right. And it had nothing to do with diet. And then it became this concept of, hang on, this is maybe a sellable product. And then they literally came along and then Loma Linda was included because you needed to sell books in the U.S. In the U.S., that's right. They needed to have an American one, Dan Woodner. You, you needed you can't, you're not going to make lots of book sales from talking about <laughs> Sardinia and, and um, Okinawa. <laughs> Okinawa. And so therefore, therefore they needed to entrench a U.S. community. Did not know that. And, and then so Loma Linda came <laughs> into that. And then they said, okay, because Loma Linda's now in it, okay, what's that? That's it. Well, that's theoretically the Garden of Eden diet, which, as we've just talked about, completely unsustainable eating fruits, nuts and seeds. It's not even vegan, vegetarian. It's just, it's just so literally off the planet. And as it turns out, the definition of vegan, according in the Adventist, Adventist, Health, in the Adventist <laughs> Health Study, is that you don't eat meat more than once a month. And vegetarian, not more than once a week. So, well, hang on, this isn't vegan, this isn't vegetarian, this isn't that traditional Eastern vegetarian, this is Western marketing, what I call marketing-based science. You've heard of evidence-based science? <laughs> and you've got called, um, eminence-based science, which is what a lot of what we're up against, which people, you know, professors say, said this, so therefore that's the way it stays. I've got this other term called marketing-based science, and well, this is just all marketing-based science, and it's literally just made up. But if you control the message and you control the advertising and you have a message of fear, so, you know, meat causes cancer, meat, mm -hmm. co meat causes masturbation, meat causes violence, meat causes cancer, meat causes heart disease, which we moved to, now meat causes planetary decline. That's right. And climate change. It's, mm -hmm. it's literally just made up. But if you keep having this message of fear and it's going to be this, you know, terrible abomination for all of society now because they didn't win on meat causes, <clears throat> violence, masturbation, cancer or <clears throat> even heart disease. So now meat causes climate change is the latest tact. Yep. And when you just track it all back, it's just people believe this stuff because you keep hearing it. Yep. And the concern yep. is that vegan... <clears throat> 
definition might well work for people who are Seventh-day Adventists. It's like to have meat once a month. Right. It may be enough to sustain their health. That's right. But the general public doesn't hear that. They don't know. They hear vegan and they go, that's no animal proteins and no animal fats. And so I think this is also something we need to really highlight and question is that that's not the public's perception of a definition. Yeah, that's right. That is such a good point for somebody that's unfamiliar with the blue zones. You know, and again, I'm glad you brought up the kind of original idea of the study. We notice a few places that have more um, octogenarians. So is that right? Did I say that right? Yes. Um, people yes. that live to be, a cent- excuse me, centenarians. We see more centenarians. Centenarians, I guess. but a lot of them actually didn't have high centenarians. Ah, so yes. it's 80, 80 or more. Okay. <laughs> yes, but I was still right. okay. yeah. Awesome. Um, so, so we notice these places, people seem to live longer. Let, well, great. Let's go check them out. Let's see what they're doing. So diet mm-hmm. might be part of it. Uh, it might be that they are really active and healthy. Maybe their community yes. is a big part of it. There's so many confounding variables, just like everything else in epidemiology. You can only look at an area, make some associations, but you can't prove causation. And this gets brought up all the time. I get questions about the blue zones all the time. And the number of inconsistencies when you start to go over to, you know, the the journalists who report about it, Loma Linda <laughs> is, is far less populated than some of these other areas. I want to say it's like 23,000 people are even there. There's questions about other places on the planet where people live far longer, like indigenous tribes. People brought up Iceland. Why wasn't Iceland included? They eat tons of animal products and they live very long, healthy lives. It's absolutely ridiculous to say that it's like vegetables and fruits that are what is keeping these people alive <laughs> yeah. it's not even true the other areas are geographically isolated ah. they're removed from western food loma linda's refu- removed from western food because they make all their food gary and i went into the supermarket it is canned packaged there, there is a small area of fresh food but absolute buckets well, no, it would have been most <laughs> of it imported fresh food Imported fresh, and then they had these buckets and massive containers of all of the alternative meats, milks, and um, cereals. It was just mind blowing how much they had there. And I think the the idea with the other blue zone areas is they looked at birth certificates and they looked at you no know, people that were <coughs> entrenched in those areas at, in Loma Linda, especially it, was, it wasn't even discovered until 1910 by Ellen G. White, and then they built the university and the hospital and things there. So people weren't necessarily born there as Seventh-day Adventists. And Ah. um, the Life Assurance Ministries, which are a group of ex-Adventists, say that really it's a retirement village. So the people who are affluent, which the other blue zone areas are not affluent, so people are affluent, health conscious and doing really, really well, tend to migrate there. But they also have the benefit of a massive hospital and so other Seventh-day Adventists who may be there are people who work at the university and the hospital. There's about 9,000 of that 23 that are wow. Seventh-day Adventists. Wow. And they are, some people there are doing very, very well with their health. But there's other confounding factors, the spiritualism, and a great I, um, thing that I read the other day was they don't want to cheat. In our normal society, if you decide you don't want to eat dessert anymore you want to reduce your sugar you're so pressured by people around you because of their guilt oh go on just have a little bit of this just have a little bit of that at Loma Linda nobody would say that because everybody wants to hold on to their belief that they are eating the right way because of a religious teaching so that would also make a huge difference to those people at Loma Linda yeah wow wow but but they but not all Seventh-day Adventists are healthy. But that, that's, <laughs> it's, it's not an original blue zone. It's, just, right. it's no. just, and when if you, if you look at the diet of the original blue zones, they were largely based on animal, animal-based foods, animal and they protein and healthy fats, and, and, and they ate, and they ate plants, right? and they ate plants. It wasn't highly processed no. food, and I, it. it, it I, can't, I just can't believe the results that the Adventist groups are coming out with mm. because, A, the, the studies are being done to prove something. Yeah. They, they, mm. Their definitions are fluid. 
There's this a big paper that's come out recently from the American Society of Lifestyle Medicine about American clinical, uh, sorry, American College, um, for the guidelines for diabetes management, and talk about a fluid document. Whoa! Like, like, like they couldn't. They looked for consensus statements, not literature. They only found 60 out of 131 that sort of fitted their narrative, and that was only after they changed 11 of them. Wow. And then. And then they couldn't prove that they could put diabetes into remission for six months. So then they changed the definition of remission of diabetes to three months. They talk about it in the paper. It's just, it's, I said to Belinda, this is a smoke and mirrors paper, but without any mirrors because they're not reflecting on it. And it's so non transparent, it's just all smoke. It is, it's just, but the trouble is that document then gets adopted by the American Endocrinological Society as being a mm. you know, re, that plant-based is a worth method of putting re, diabetes into remission. I, I just I can't find the papers that actually say that. And diabetes, um, you know, the best papers that have been coming out plant-based saying that you can reduce the HbA1c, the control of diabetes, by 0.3 percent. That 0.3 percent is nothing. Nothing. And it's Compared to not, the people you've been interviewing, <laughs> it's, it's not it's not remission. You know, it's like you know, and this is. But nonetheless, they they keep saying it. They keep publishing. Oh, they published it in their own journal, by the way. Yeah, so it's, it's not. And peer review was one of their members actually reviewing what the president of the organisation had written. So. Yeah, it's, so the American College of Lifestyle Medicine began as the American Christian. Uh, sorry, American Christian Lifestyle Medicine. And it was, sorry, the Christian Association of Lifestyle Medicine, it was called CALM at the beginning at Loma Linda University in 2003. It became the American College of Lifestyle Medicine in 2004 with exactly the same people, the same nine um, key people that are devout Seventh-day Adventists at that thing. But the American College of Lifestyle Medicine has grown and grown. It's it's now running exams around the world. And what I say to the Australasian Society of Lifestyle Medicine here is that no matter, even if you don't have people on your board who are Seventh-day Adventists, when people, regular people, say Gary was to sign up for the Australasian Society of Lifestyle Medicine, which has a seemingly endless benevolent agenda, and it does sound really, really good, but you don't realise until you get in there that they're plant-based um, discussions are actually heading towards veganism. <clears throat> they are demonising animal proteins and fats. And They've got people in the cereal industry and everyone else. But when these people sign up to be part of that society, they do the exams with the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, and these exams were written by the founder and key people in the Seventh-day Adventist Church and also, unfortunately, key people in Coca-Cola. So the idea is for health professionals, and I'm talking all health professionals, including exercise physiologists, dietitians, you know, um, med medical doctors and nurses, dietitians, everybody, the idea is for them to write prescriptions for lifestyle medicine and exercise as medicine. And these, I, this idea is that people will eat less, move more, sorry, move more, eat less, meat and if you don't understand that that messaging is coming from religious ideology and vested interests, it's it's really hard to, <clears throat> to challenge that. And you get in, caught up in that whole society, in these societies everywhere all around the world, but the American College of Lifestyle Medicine is the hub. It is the basis of this whole lifestyle medicine branding and that's where it's come from. And, and with, with a huge, because they've got this enormous amount of money behind them, because we're talking the cereal mm -hmm. industry, the soy, the alternate meat industries, their basis, which can then push this down the pathway of medical education to get lifestyle medicine into the universities. How many universities? I think are it's in York? eight universities in the US at the moment, and they're pushing to get it into medical education here in Australia. And I'm jumping up and down trying to go. Um, excuse me. <laughs> But even the society says, but we are not involved with this, you know, we're not the Seventh-day Adventist church at, in our society because, interestingly, the church has a very small footprint here in Australia. They have this massive food industry. They have a university college and they have maybe three or four smaller private hospitals. That's all. You've got 84 hospitals in the U.S. 
owned by the church. Plus now the Blue Zones, which is able to get into so many more cultures. 1,400 communities. 1,400 communities plus they want to run the Blue Zones across all of the West Coast. And and those communities paid... One of them, I found a document saying six and a half million dollars for them to be accredited as a blue zone. <laughs> so that, that's your local mayor. <laughs> I'm Signing sorry, up. your local mayor has just signed up to make your community into a blue zone and probably paid six and a half million dollars. May have paid <laughs> six and a half million dollars to US. a church to a church organization so that you can take <clears> up a fake blue zone mentality. So you know, they've got cash coming in hand over foot and they've been convincing regulators, administrators, politicians, um, and, and at a local level. It sounds great. Okay. Lifestyle medicine, what a great term, you know. And if you go on to, they've got everything on lifestyle medicine. If you look up all the different Google searches, dot com, dot net, dot. This was a long time ago because they've got other ones. Probably they've got lo- the other ones now. <laughs> They owned all of them. Wow. The only one they don't have is one we have. <laughs> <laughs> but lifestyle medicine dot wiki. I don't know. What, <laughs> I don't know what we're going to do with it. But I, thought, I, I finally got. Oh, I found one that they don't have. That's great. But, but they, they literally have. You know, this media saturation and political saturation, and they say right through to. American Dietary Guideline Committee, World Health right Organization, government. U- government, United Nations, politicians. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, can we change it all? N- no. Can we make more people aware? Yes. And the mere fact that we're having this conversation with you and that, you, you know, you've got Jane's book there, the great, yes. the great plant-based <clears throat> con, it means that more and more people are getting aware yeah. And it, because this, this, there's only one exit strategy here, and that's to be led by the people. Yeah. yeah well, and I, I think it's really important just to say we're not anti religion. <laughs> it might sound like it. We're not anti religion. We're not anti vegan. We're pro choice. And it wasn't until I realized that our choice, Gary's choice to improve his own health and the health of his patients, was being taken away by a group that was protecting their ideology. And, and I'm very much about the corporate church when I talk about this. Not many individuals, most That's individuals right. within any church religion believe what they're being told and mm. they love the community that they're involved in. Right. So I'm not talking about individuals necessarily. Um, this is about the corporatization of a church that is profiting off, I would say, band-aiding sick care because they are absolutely strict and have such a strong structure around this promotion of a diet that isn't necessarily about health unless you eat all of their highly processed, fortified, supplemented foods. And they are taking it into third world countries. And as Gary mentioned before, when they he talked about this health, um, medical evangelism as the right arm of the church and their health reform message being the entering wedge I've found multiple documents stating they're able to get into places like China that won't necessarily allow Christianity in there. They take it in as health. They say, we'll open a hospital. We'll open this. We'll help educate people. And that is the concern that they do truly use it as an entering wedge. They will use it as an entering wedge to the secular community. We'll do a cooking class with you. We'll We'll, do this. And then... People are brought into that. They don't talk about the church for a while. Like it's it's a bit insidious how a lot of the work is done because this is a total member involvement. That's what the actual general conference have called it. Every single member of the Seventh-day Adventist church is to use their health reform message as an entering wedge to society in whatever way they can do it. And certainly as a medical community, that's their belief, that's their commission and they are purpose-driven, and until they encourage enough people to give up meat, their belief is there's no point Jesus coming back to earth because in the Garden of Eden we won't be eating meat. And so he's not going to waste his time, from what I've been reading, in coming back until they get enough people to convert, and certainly themselves. If you read some of Ellen G. White's early writings, she says, no person who is teaching health 
No minister will eat meat. We'll have it on their table. No meat, milk, eggs. Didn't talk about, sorry, didn't talk about eggs and butter as strictly, but in time that will happen and that's, again, why Harry Miller and these other guys, the Adventist Health Studies, have to prove that you can actually be healthy without those things. So they have to create the foods to provide that. This final and brief clip is taken from episode 303 of Boundless Body Radio, where we interviewed Jane Reese Buxton. We are going to be hosting her uh, again very soon on the show, so be looking forward to that. She is the author of the amazing book, The Great Plant-Based Con, and I thought this would be an important clip to kind of end on to understand the implications of, of what all of these things mean and when we talk about the blue zones, how that impacts us nutritionally to today. Who is making money when we decide to do plant-based diets, and, and you mentioned pharma, you mentioned the, the medical system, um, we mentioned the media. Can you tell us a little, little bit about what, what happens financially when people decide to eat a plant-based diet and who is pushing that agenda forward? Yeah, so I think there's an interesting line of a, a, a set of connections that happens. So the, the plant-based diet and the, these vegan processed foods represent a huge marketing opportunity to processed food companies. I don't need to tell you that. It's, it's, it's obvious. This is what's happening. And these companies, they have to chase growth. They have to chase profit. This is what they do. So you can't blame them. That's what they do. And um, But then the kind of insidious effect is that is they not only chase those profits, but because of the need to market the products, they attach these arguments, they attach the environmental arguments and the health arguments to help sell those products, right? And then they have to prove that those things are true. So there's a lot of funding that goes towards the science community to support those claims. And, you know, there's um, research that shows that something like 70% of the funding for food and nutrition studies comes from food companies, right? So... So then you get scientists in that community who know which side their bread's buttered. They know where that funding is coming from. They're very interested in getting funding for their next study. So they will orient their studies towards proving that vegan diets and plant foods are better for you. And then the media gets involved because they love those headlines. They absolutely love the clickbait that goes with vegan diet will make you live five years longer, right? So it's a lovely little circle. So they get more advertising revenue, not to mention the funding that some of these media organizations also get from the char- from the animal rights charities and the, the plant-based meat companies. It's a wonderful circle of follow the money, right? That's what's driving it. But when you look at the media element and where it ends up, the message is being consumed by the consumer. As you saw some of the examples in my book, almost all the studies that are propagated as being definitive proof that a vegan diet is better for you, will make you live longer, give you less cancer, whatever the claim is. When you dissect the studies, they almost never prove anything like that. Sometimes they prove the opposite. And I think the public need to be totally on their guard, completely aware that most of the headlines they read about nutrition research are going to be false. And in fact, you know as well as I do that John Ioannidis, the famous epidemiologist at Stanford, has said, you know, 80% of published studies are false. So we need to be aware of that as consumers of this information. Thank you so very much for listening to this lengthy episode all about the Blue Zones and the information that we've collected on our show over the years about the Blue Zones, what they are, in response to the movie Live to 100, Secret of the Blue Zones that has been released on Netflix. I Okay, so I watched this documentary twice, and I have to say it's incredibly well-made. They did a fantastic job, and I can say that I probably sat there and nodded along with about 95% of the content that they were showing. The people were active. They were very happy. They, they prioritized laughter and community, and there's just so many amazing things and lessons that we can learn from documentaries like this. 
Um, I just don't love the narrative that a plant-based diet is the only way that you can live a long and healthy life. I think all of us want to do the very best that we can while we're here to live healthy, to be around for our kids and for our grandkids. You know, for myself, it includes always being you know, confused about nutrition and what the best advice is. Um, and I've seen people live and thrive using lots of different diets. And I really don't care what people choose as the diet. I just, the, the narrative of the movie was that you had to do it with a plant-based diet in all of these areas in the world where people live the longest or eat eating a 90 to 98% plant diet. And I just, I would like to counter that argument with other information, which we've attempted to do here. Huge thank you to all of our guests who contributed. Obviously there was a lot of research done um, to get to this spot of you know, where these people know so much about this topic. Um, as always, if you're enjoying Boundless Body Radio, please give us a rating or review on Apple. We really appreciate those. And thank you so very much as always for listening to Boundless Body Radio.